So we're going to be looking at experimentation in 15th and 16th century Italian art. And so we're not going to do this, but in Canvas, I have an assignment for this lesson. And we're going to be looking at the Last Supper. So the Last Supper is a very common um, story, right? Or common story. It's a story that's in the New Testament. And it's one of the stories um, in the passion of Jesus. So it's those last few um, days of his life. And so in that story, there's some really key points. And so there's kind of a history of using the Last Supper as subject matter. And so with that story, the Last Supper is a Seder feast. So remember at the Golden, ha uh, when we looked at the Golden Haggadah, we talked about the Seder. It's during Passover, and this is where Jews um, celebrate um, over a meal. And so Jesus, being a Jew himself, all of his followers being Jewish, uh, they were having the Seder feast. And um, in this, um, two important events take place. One is where we have the Holy Communion or the Eucharist being established. So this is where Jesus offers his followers bread and wine. And so in Matthew 26, it talks about, he, he tells his followers that to take the bread, right? And take the wine and that the bread is his body and the wine is his blood. And there are still people who are um, Christians today who actually believe that when they eat the bread, it's not just a symbol of his body, but there's this magical transformation where that bread actually is the body of Jesus and that the wine actually is the, the blood of, of Jesus. And so this is a kind of an important event in the Last Supper, which is not typical of the Seder feast, right? This is very different. This is something special that he did. Also at the Last Supper, Jesus tells his followers that one of them amongst him will betray him. And so it's kind of this climatic moment where there's going to be this major betrayal. And that person, of course, who betrays him or already had betrayed him was Judas. And so you've probably heard of, you know, don't be a Judas, right? Don't be someone who um, gives, uh, you know, who basically um, does wrong by a friend. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time looking at other works outside of Leonardo's, but I want to show that the Last Supper was a very typical scene, right? So here we have a northern early Renaissance painting. This would be very similar to like the Merode altarpiece. Remember the Merode altarpiece with all that symbolism inside? This is by Dirk Bouts, and look at how the floor is tilted, right? The floor is tilted, it has a high horizon, and that allows us to see all the people around the table. It allows us to see the table itself. And this kind of shows that solemn moment of Jesus saying that the bread is his body and the wine is his blood, right? So that's kind of the focus of this one, okay? So here's that comparison there. Sorry, I should have skipped that slide, okay? So this is a early Renaissance version of The Last Supper. This is by Castanago. And with this one, right, what do you think the emphasis is? We have 12 people here and one person is on the opposite side of the table. Do you think this is about the Eucharist or is this about the betrayal? What's the visual clue here? I gave you a major hint. Jeffrey, what do you think? Uh, I think it's about, yeah, like the feast, the Eucharist. It's about the betrayal because we have, we have Judas isolated. See how he's like the visual clue here is he's not around everyone else, right? So he's kind of stuck by himself. So this one is the emphasis on that betrayal. So here's kind of those early Renaissance characteristics. Right. So the last 
one that we have for the Last Supper, actually not the last, the second to the last is going to be by Leonardo. And so I have a fun video for us. I'm going to pause um, the recording. So hopefully I'll remember to record after we're done because this is probably copyrighted. So bear with, bear with me, we're going to be a little silly here. The theme for High Renaissance is very similar to Early Renaissance. For the High Renaissance, you could draw yourself a picture of a triangle and then use those initials of PMA again. And so where Early Renaissance is kind of like in the low font, High Renaissance would be in a capitalized font. And these characteristics are much, much more uh, pronounced, but much bigger. So even the patrons and the commissions and the artists are viewed as much like bigger than life people. The reason we put it in a triangle is because of Leonardo. And so Leonardo famously used a triangle composition in order to organize his imagery, but also he was very much interested in divine numbers. So just like in the Gothic where we talked about divine numbers of threes and fours and twelves and twenty fours, Leonardo was interested in three as well because it represented religion. But then we also know that he was really compelled by science. So like the Fibonacci sequence, he was looking for it in objects that were natural and using that Fibonacci sequence in order to organize compositions and to design his artworks. So here's some variations from the early Renaissance to the high. So we're gonna still have perspective modeling anatomy. We're gonna still have positive mental attitude and humanism, but we're gonna have a few differences as well. So in the high Renaissance, they're not bound by these universal laws as much as the early Renaissance artists. So they're not always compelled to use numerical harmony, mathematics, or proportion. We, or excuse me, perspective. Um, we only saw very few early Renaissance because we had to zip through it. And the ones in the 250, really other than Frau Filippo Lippi's frame, doesn't have linear perspective. But if you were to do a early Renaissance search in Google, you would see hundreds and hundreds of examples of paintings that have perspective just so they, they could show off that they knew Brunelleschi figured it out. Um, but we have a lot less um, rules of three. I always kind of think of um, Leonardo as kind of being the bridge between the early Renaissance and the high Renaissance. You know, he got fame first, right? And he started developing these characteristics in the late 1300s, or excuse me, the late 1400s, where, um, you know, Michelangelo and Raphael were doing it in the 1500s. So he came first. Um, they were more concerned with visual infective effectiveness like impact and monumentality. So they were really interested in the expressive quality of the figures, the emotion, the composition, um, as well as making these images larger than life. Um, that kind of goes naturally into the next one. A lot of the commissions by these patrons, people like the Pope, um, these wealthy, rich, Florentine, um, Mil uh, Milanese, excuse me, is it what's Milanese? People from Milan, <laughs> the Roman families. Um, they had all this money and so they created these large commissions where they built some of the biggest structures since antiquity or they would paint the whole room rather than just one little painting or one little altarpiece. So there was this kind of impossible scale that many artists actually were able to finish in their lifetime. There's many that never did get finished though. There's a lot more drama to engage the viewer. Um, the compositions are a lot more complex. So they tend to have like clusters and like groupings of people, which we often call monumental groupings, right? And then of course we still have the emphasis on perspective, modeling, and anatomy. Okay, so we're going to see some variations from early Renaissance. Now, I'm not going to watch this silly bit video, but this is a Mel Brooks version of The Last Supper if you're interested in it. So we're on number 73, which is our um, Leonardo's Last Supper. Right, so 
the location for this, a little bit of the context. This is painted in Milan and it is placed in the monastery of Santa Maria del Grazie. And so this is a monastery and it was placed in a dining hall. Last summer supper imagery, right? An image of a feast. It kind of makes sense that it would be placed in a dining hall. So this was pretty common. Okay, so Leonardo was commissioned to come to Milan to paint this scene. Right, so in his painting, what part of the story do you think is emphasized? Are we talking about that miracle of the bread and the wine or are we talking about the betrayal? What visual evidence supports those assumptions? What do you think? Feel free to throw it in the chat. What's your vote? The miracle or the betrayal? So we got a lot of miracles here. Anyone contradict that one? Everyone believes the same? Um, here is the smart history link at the very bottom if you haven't already watched that, right? So the miracle part that you guys were talking about, notice how Jesus is in the center and he's reaching for the bread, right? Can you see how he's reaching for the bread, right? So there is kind of that moment explained in this painting. However, Leonardo, right, you know, a true Renaissance man, he knows that imagery can be much more complex than just one thing. He actually tells both parts of the story. And this is a little bit different than those other two that we saw, okay? So this actually has both, right? In this one, in the close-up here, we can see the reaction of the betrayal. So Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And in the groupings of people, which we'll see in just a little bit, they're all kind of reacting to that. Like they're contemplating it. They're like, well, could it be me? Am I the one who's going to betray him? Oh, Jesus, it couldn't possibly be me. There's like the self dialogue and Judas is right here. Judas is actually rather close to Jesus in this painting. His face is in shadow, which is kind of foreboding in a way, right? And he is reaching for the same platter and the same bread, because you guys see it right here, as Jesus. So this is a marker of that betrayal, that they reach for the same thing. Ju Judas also in the other hand has the purse which has the money that represents his betrayal because he was paid by the romans for his knowledge of where jesus was and who jesus was because he betrays him with a kiss he re he he kisses jesus on the cheek and that's how the romans know who jesus is so this is pretty complex right okay so how do we know that this is high Renaissance? What's the Renaissance characteristics of it, okay? This is kind of a bridge between early Renaissance and high Renaissance because it is bound by universal laws. Notice it has numerical harmony. When you look at the people, can you see how they're in four groups of three? Can you see that? So we have four groups of three people, okay? We have Jesus in the shape of a triangle, right? Jesus, his head is the top and his elbows are the other side. So he looks like a triangle. The space is organized by linear perspective. See how all the ceilings, the coiffured ceilings, all go back to a single vanishing point. I'll have an illustration of that in a little bit. These doorways or tapestries, we don't know what it is. Um, I'll explain that in a little bit too. On the sides, all go back to that single vanishing point, which leads to Jesus's head. 
okay? So here are, oops, right, the characteristics of this. <clears throat> in the high Renaissance, most artists of Rome work in fresco, right? So like Giotto, remember Giotto working on wet plaster, right? Most of these Roman painters worked in this fashion. Leonardo, right, Leonardo is kind of this different sort of artist, right? He's a scientist. And so he decides he's going to experiment. This is basically oil paint on plaster. It does not work very well. This painting started deteriorating weeks, months, years after it was painted. It did not hold up really well. And that's one of the reasons why we have no clue if these are tapestries or doorways, because the imagery is flaking off and disappearing, right? But he was trying to be innovative. The Venetians tend to use oil. And so when we talk about Titian, we'll explain why they chose oil rather than fresco. Okay, um, this is a rather large commission. You saw in the image that this is the whole wall on the back of that, um, that monastery dining hall, right? There's a lot more drama to engage the viewer with these groupings. We see these individual reactions. We have balanced composition and we have that perspective modeling and anatomy. The imagery looks 3D, right? We don't have nude, you know, with anatomy, but we have realistic proportions, right? So how is it organized, right? We have our four groups of three, right? We have our triangle shape. We have our linear perspective. Right? So Leonardo characteristics. He uses a technique that we call atmospheric perspective. We've talked about this before, right? Atmospheric perspective is where things get hazier as it moves into the distance. He also uses a technique that we call sfumato. And so that has a hazy quality too. How he shades his figures, remember or notice that there's kind of this smoky kind of quality to them rather than like a crisp edge and a softness that we see in like the work of Botticelli. And so he uses this hazy technique, just not just for the background behind the windows, but he uses it for the modeling of the figures as well. So there's kind of this smoky sort of characteristic. You can see that really well in this close-up image of Mona Lisa. Okay, so this is a late Renaissance example of a um, Last Supper. And you can see that this Tintoretto, he's from Venice, is more based on, excuse me, this concept of um, the miracle, right? Notice how there's halos here. Notice how there's kind of these apparitions in the sky. This is kind of like a holy event. And so we can see the drama developing from high Renaissance to late Renaissance where it gets even more dramatic, right? So factors of the high Renaissance. Humanism, right? Revival of classics. We have those um, political powers of these nation states. We have a lot of papal power. So the Pope really during the high Renaissance is probably one of the most powerful people on the planet. Um, we also have the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation taking place in this time. We have those large patrons of those enormous commissions, and then we have the rise of the artist, right? So we already know a lot about Leonardo, right? We know he was not just a scientist, but he was a painter, a sculptor, an engineer. Um, there's this uh, website here that you can use. I've got interactive link that kind of talks about it. Um, he's probably the, the, a good example of a genius who has a hard time finishing things. Probably most of his commissions never were really completed very well because he was kind of like all over the place. Um, he was a sculptor. Um, he was taken to Milan 
um, to paint or to, excuse me, to sculpt a large equestrian monument. He sort of started it, but then eventually the metal that was going to be used for it was used for weapons. Remember that mil military power of Milan, but Donat um, it was kind of in the tradition of Donatello and Verruccio that we saw in the early Renaissance. Um, he does a series of commissions. So this is a good example of his triangle composition, right? Where he or puts people in a series of three. But when we look at the characteristics of Leonardo, he often does these fantastical backgrounds. And you can see those in the windows of the Last Supper, right? And he has that smoky quality, but he's always organizing them according to Fibonacci sequence or rule of thirds. Here's a large cartoon. This is this would be a preliminary drawing. Cartoon actually is a preliminary drawing for another painting or a fresco, right? And then here you can see the sfumato, but you can also see the chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro is a dramatic difference between light and dark. This is something we're going to see a lot in Baroque, which happens after the late, the late Renaissance. Notice how light her skin is and how dark the shadow is. It makes the scenes much more dramatic. All right, here's all my, you know, why is she so famous? There's a great video on this that I have attached to the PowerPoint too. Um, it's in one of the hidden slides. You're welcome to look at, but it takes a long time. It's like a 12 minute video that we're not gonna watch. So he notoriously kept a sketchbook. He dug up burials. He went to graveyards to study anatomy. He could have been like tried for blasphemy for that kind of thing. Maybe not blasphemy, something else. Um, you know, invented a little helicopter, right? He studied uh, Vitruvian. So just like Alberte, he studied Vitruvian architecture. And so that concept of the perfect square and the circle. And so those are the things that you see in the Last Supper. So when we go back to the Last Supper, we can see the atmospheric perspective in the windows. They act in a way like halos without an actual halo, right? We have that, that um, sfumato with the soft modeling. Right? We have the linear perspective to organize the space. We even have these monumental groupings of three groups of four, but also the whole group is in the front. Everyone is kind of pushed up so that the scene is really emphasized in the front. Right? So if you haven't jotted down in your notes a bunch of these characteristics, I'd probably write down these things because there's a lot of similarities in the work of Leonardo to Raphael. And so you're going to want to make sure that you know the differences between these two artists. Okay. So, um, this video right here, I'm not going to go through it, but um, we're going to look at Raphael next. Raphael dies at a very young age. Um, he dies, I think, in his 30s. Um, he was a very popular Renaissance artist. Everyone loved him. Not only was he a tremendous painter, he was beautiful, he was young, um, he was personable, um, he was theatrical. Um, he designed sets for theater of the day. Um, you know, the uber elite of the day um, loved him, um, you know, invited him to all their parties. He was like the life of, of the party. And so when he died in his early 30s or his in his 30s, um, he was buried in the Pantheon. So this actually has a video from Art of the Western World, which explains how important he was to the Renaissance and, you know, how it really makes sense that he be in a, uh, a you know, an ancient building because his artwork is so connected to that revival of the ancient classical world, right? So when we look at Raphael's work, his early paintings look a lot like Leonardo. Um, as a young artist, he would have known a Leonardo because he came first. 
Here's Leonardo's Madonna of the Rocks. And he has, Leonardo has other paintings that look very similar to this. Madonna and Child, Madonna and Child with St. John, using a triangle composition, right? Um, it was very common. And he used things like sfumato. Notice the soft modeling, right? So Raphael kind of mimicked the style of Leonardo, right? So the artwork that we're going to have um, is the School of Athens. And so we're going to be looking at um, smart history. We are going to watch this video today. So as you're watching the video in your note takers, I would like you, to, like you to jot down some notes on this as you watch. What is the function of all of the paintings in this room, right? What room is it and how does it reflect the patron? I cannot emphasize enough that is one of the areas that we are not, we're not really putting a lot of focus on in our note takers is that when we know who the patron is, let's make sure we're identifying it because it is a favorite kind of like multiple choice question because we're not only thinking about the artist who designed this, but these were specifically made for people and a certain person. So we wanna make sure that we understand the relationship between the imagery and why it was made for that person. Maybe. We're in the very crowded and not very large room called the Sanza della Signatura that is not only dense with people, but it's dense with imagery. We're looking at frescoes by Raphael. Painted during the High Renaissance, at the same time that Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling, just a few doors away. This room was originally a library, part of the papal apartments, that is the apartments where the Pope lived. In order to imagine what this room would have looked like at the beginning of the 16th century, imagine away all of these people and imagine instead the lower walls lined with books. And also imagine quiet, which is hard to do here, and an environment of learning where you could look up at what Raphael painted here on the four walls, which are the four branches of human knowledge. Philosophy having to do with things of this world. But philosophy at this time also meant what we now call the sciences. On the opposite wall, theology, having to do with issues relating to God and the divine. And on the two other walls, poetry and justice. So these four areas of human knowledge are symbolized by allegorical figures that we see on the ceiling. And it's so clear that a few doors away is Michelangelo, because Raphael's clearly looking at Michelangelo's figures on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, especially the prophets and the sibyls. What a moment in the High Renaissance, all commissioned thanks to Pope Julius II. And think about what it means for theology to be presented equally with human knowledge. It is this extraordinarily liberal moment in church history. When humanist classical learning can be united with the teachings of the church in the center of the School of Athens, the fresco that represents philosophy, we have the two great philosophers from antiquity in the center, Plato and Aristotle, surrounded by other great thinkers and philosophers and mathematicians from antiquity. Virtually every known great figure. But let's start with the two in the center. We can tell Plato from Aristotle because Plato is older. Plato was in fact Aristotle's teacher, but also because he holds one of his own books, the Timaeus. And Aristotle holds his book, the Ethics. And both of those books represent the contrasting philosophies of these two men. Plato was known for being interested in the ethereal, the theoretical, that which could
could not be seen. And in fact, we see him pointing upward. This idea that the world of appearances is not the final truth, that there is a realm that is based on mathematics, on pure idea, that is more true than the everyday world that we see. Whereas Aristotle, his student, focused his attention on the observable, the actual, the physical. And you'll notice that his palm is down and he seems to be saying, no, 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 let's pay attention to what is here. Right, to what we can see and observe in the world. And in fact, if you look at the colors that each of the figures wear, they refer to this division. Plato wears red and purple, the purple referring to the ether, what we would call the air, the red to fire, neither of which have weight. And Aristotle wears blue and brown, that is the colors of earth and water, which have gravity, which have weight. So the philosophers on either side of Plato and Aristotle continue this division. On the side of Plato, we see philosophers concerned with issues of the ideal. For example, on the lower left, we see Pythagoras, the great ancient mathematician who discovered laws of harmony and music in mathematics. This idea that there is a reality that transcends the reality that we see. Compare that to the lower right where we see Euclid, the figure we associate with geometry, and in fact, he seems to be drawing a geometric diagram for some very eager students, but he is interested in measure, that is the idea of the practical. Euclid is modeled actually on a friend of Raphael's, and that's Fermante, the great architect, asked by Pope Julius II to provide a new model for a new St. Peter's. And in fact, appropriate to his reincarnation here as Euclid, Fermante's design for St. Peter's was based on a perfect geometry of circles and squares. And is really visible in the architecture that Raphael constructed for the School of Athens. Here we see an architecture that is very Fermantian, but also very very ancient Roman. We have coffered barrel vaults, pilasters. This is a space that ennobles the figures that it contains. And we can see representations of classical sculpture in the niches on the left, that is on the platonic side. We see Apollo, the god of the sun, the god of music, the god of poetry, things that would be appropriate to the platonic. And in turn, on the right, we see Athena, the god of war and wisdom, who presumably is involved in the more practical affairs of man. All of this seems to me to be a place that is the opposite of the medieval, where knowledge was something that was passed down by authority and one had to accept it. But here, on the walls of the papal apartments, we get this image of sharing knowledge, the history of the accumulation of knowledge, all with figures who move beautifully, who in their bodies represent a gracefulness that is a reflection of their inner wisdom and knowledge. Well, you'll notice that Raphael has not placed any names within the painting. The only identifiers are perhaps the titles of the books that both Plato and Aristotle hold. And so we're meant to understand who these figures are through their movement, through their dress. Now, the artist has parted both groups to the left and the right so that the middle foreground is fair empty. He does this, I think, for a couple of reasons. He wants the linear perspective at the bottom of the painting to balance the strong orthogonals at the top of the painting, and he wants to make way for the advancement of Plato and Aristotle as they walk down the stairs. But we also have two figures in the foreground in the middle. We have Diogenes, and most interestingly, we have the ancient philosopher Heraclitus, who seems to be writing and thinking quietly by himself. Most of the other figures in this painting are engaged with others, but not this man. He seems to be lost in his own thoughts. Well, and he is writing on a block of marble, and in fact his features are those of the great artist Michelangelo, known for his rather lonely and brooding personality. Raphael has painted him here in the same pose as the prophet Isaiah on the Sistine ceiling, although Isaiah looks up, and here Michelangelo's Heraclitus decidedly looks down. And so it's so interesting that Raphael is paying homage to Michelangelo, the great artist here personifying Heraclitus, a philosopher who believed that all things were always in flux. The figure of Heraclitus was actually added later. Raphael finished the fresco, added some wet plaster, and added in that figure. We should also note that Raphael included himself here. That's the young figure looking directly out at us in a black cap and standing among some of the most important astronomers of all time. Including Ptolemy, who theorized about the movements of the planets. And Zoastra, who's holding the celestial orb. We're so far here from the medieval idea of the artist as a craftsman. Here the artist is considered an intellectual on par with some of the greatest thinkers in history who can express these important ideas.
So we have dozens of figures here without any sense of stiffness or repetition. Raphael, like Leonardo in The Last Supper, divides the figures into groups. Each figure overlaps and moves easily between and amongst the others. My favorite two figures are the ones just behind Euclid, one leaning against the wall with his leg crossed over the other, who's hurrying and writing some notes, the other leaning over and watching. There's a wonderful I, sense of intimacy there. And I think it's a scene you could see walking along the hallway of any college or university. For all the free movement of the figures, the architecture itself is using linear perspective in a rigorous way. You can follow the orthogonals either in the pavement or in the cornices as they recede back. So the illusion of space here is incredible. Look at the way that the decoration of the Greek meander seems as if it goes back in space. What's interesting, though, is if this architecture is harking back to any ancient tradition, it's harking back to the Roman tradition, not to the Greeks, who would never use barrel in this way. Nearby, Bramante, Raphael, Michelangelo could see the Baths of Caracalla or the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine. There was Roman architectural ruins all over the city that resembled what Raphael has painted here. It's so extraordinary that we're celebrating here the pantheon of great pagan thinkers. None of these men were Christians. Let's take a quick look at the fresco that's opposite the School of Athens, known as the Disputa. And this fresco represents theology, the study of the divine. We're going to stop there. Sorry, my cursor keeps disappearing. Okay, so what's this room? Where is this painted? Let's go ahead and turn our cameras back on and answer the question. So where are these located? Great, so we got some libraries, that's good. Jason, you did a good job. It's not just in any old library, this is in the Pope's library. So this is in the papal apartments in the Vatican. And so this would have been made for Julius II. Please make sure that you know Julius II. He's probably the most important Pope that we're gonna need to know for art history, right? And so the function of these paintings, why aren't these paintings painted? This is in the Stanza del Signatura um, in Vatican. Um, and so this is his library. And so this was painted for the Pope. All four walls are painted on the basic branches of knowledge of the Renaissance. So they reflect the ideals of the Renaissance. So the Pope needs to be knowledgeable, not just on religion, right? But religion is demonstrated on the image that is based on the distribution of the host, right? He needed to be knowledgeable of philosophy, right? This idea of these ancient beliefs, right? And how they relate to Christian beliefs. So the School of Athens, which is our image, right? Is based on philosophy and his knowledge of philosophy. So the Pope's knowledge of philosophy. The other one would be on poetry, so literature. And so here we have Parnassus, the home of the muses being demonstrated. And then the ceiling actually has personifications of these four branches of knowledge in a coiffured ceiling. So once again, a classical design of coiffured ceilings using fresco to paint in those little niches. Okay. So here we have our School of Athens right? How is it classical? What's classical about it? What are our classical tendencies? Let's use our mics for this. Um, Jasmine, can you help me out? Give me a classical tendency. The figures are very proportional and relaxed. Very good. So there's, there's that sense of realism there with contrapposto, with realistic poses. Um, they are definitely proportional. 
Anything else? Anyone else see it? Any classical inspired elements? The video talked about architecture. There's linear perspective. Right, very good. So there's linear perspective. Now, linear perspective really, like, we see elements of it in like ancient Roman painting, but it wasn't pure perspective, but we have the idea of showing visual depth. So I wouldn't say a, class, a classical revival would be perspective, but I'd say showing linear depth is. Does that make sense? You know, atmospheric perspective, layering of space, orthogonals going back into space. What about the style of architecture, right? We've got rounded arches, barrel vaults. The video said that that was not Greek, but that's what? Aaron, what do you think? Who had rounded arches in the ancient world? The Romans. The Romans, very good. So it's very Roman to use a rounded arch, coiffured ceilings, um, barrel vaults, right? We even have classical drapery, right? Everyone looks like they are from classical times. These don't, don't look like Renaissance people. They look like they are ripped out of the history books, right? There's also a sense of symmetry with this one where it's central focused, right? And there's a sense of balance. So how does he depict space? The architecture could be based on the design of St. Peter's by Bramante. They mentioned that in um, the video. So Bramante is a high Renaissance architect that we don't have in the 250. This is probably his most famous piece called the Tempito, which is in um, Rome and Trastevere. It's a really small um, central plan church, right? And so Bramante was designing for Pope Julius II, the new St. Peter's. The old St. Peter's, that big giant basilica was run down and fallen apart. They demolish it and they rebuild it. And so Bramante starts with that central plan, right? During this high Renaissance period, right? Here is a coin that has his design. You can see that it basically is the Pantheon superimposed onto a Greek temple. And there's a series of domes and towers, right? Oh, something's wrong with my animation. Um, we're gonna go into Go Formative right now. And I'm going to put the link in the chat. And so what I'm gonna have you guys do is to come up with at least four characteristics. So when we're going to, sorry, Let me put it there so you guys can open it up. Okay, so it's in the chat right now. Go to Go Formative. We need some work on visual evidence. I can definitely see in our essays as well as some of our um, responses back to some of the questions that we need more practice on it. So visual evidence, once again, is things that you see that are physical in the artworks. You don't even need to know anything about the artworks to be able to be a visual detective. Okay, so what I want you to do is to look at the work of Giotto, Michelangelo, and Raphael. In the Go Formative question, right, in the Go Formative question, oh, I think I put them in the right order of the question. So Giotto's at the top, then Michelangelo, then Raphael. I want you to write about at least four similarities that you see amongst the works because Raphael is painting this wall at the same time Michelangelo is painting the ceiling. And Raphael and Michelangelo know of Giotto and they are emulating him in a masterful way, right? So go ahead and work on the Go formative. Yes, I did put them in the right order. So in the question, you can see Giotto's first, then Michelangelo, then Raphael.
Okay. So who can give me one? One thing that's similar between Jocto, Michelangelo, and Raphael. The drapery. Drapery. So we have classical drapery. Very good. Who said that? That was me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Who has another? Let's use our mics, please. I, I want to get away from having to monitor chat all the time because next week with online versus some people being in person, that's just too much to expect from me. So we need to be using our voices. I said there were like classical elements, uh, like columns and uh, arches. Very good. So what I would say, you know, just be as specific as possible with that is that we have classical architecture, right? So that would be a good way to phrase that too. Very good. Who has another? Um, they all use bold colors, like how Michelangelo has the, the gold colors and uh, Giotto uses the dark blues. Mm -hmm. They use a lot of intense colors and light and bright colors. Very good. It creates a sense of drama, but it really does allow you to really view all the individual elements because of the contrast. Contrast is that difference, right? A difference in something. Anything else that's similar? Uh, they have multiple scenes going on in one art piece. Right, so we've got a lot of organized visual information. We've got lots of individual stories taking place. Very good. Anything else? Like I specifically gave you Im imagery that has like elements that are very similar. Like instead of showing you the whole thing, I tried to emphasize certain sections that were similar. So what the heck is all this stuff going on at the bottom here or in between or at the bottom or in between? What's all that stuff? That's the marble. There's a lot of painted marble. Right. We've got faux marble. We've got faux sculpture. Can you see all of this? Every last element on these walls are flat, but they are painted in the illusion of being 3D. So we've got fake sculpture, fake architectural sculpture, fake relief. And we have that all over the place in these paintings, right? So I'm probably, oh, my animation is off again. I probably am missing some of them, but we mentioned most of these, right? So we have that modeling of, of realistic light and shadow. We have those bright light colors. We have classical sculpture. We've got faux, right? So fake architectural sculpture, fake architectural relief, fake marble, large scale projects, Numerous figures, numerous stories, highly organized space, right? So Raphael and Michelangelo are learning from Giotto. Raphael, and my bias is here too, Raphael is copying Michelangelo, okay? Because they're painting at the same time, right? Leon, I, my total bias, I apologize. Le Raphael is totally a copier. He copies Leonardo and he copies Michelangelo, right? He's, he, he can like take the best parts of these other artists and he synthesizes and puts it together to create amazing paintings. He's not very original, but he is masterful, right? And that's my bias. That's not in the 250, okay? Right? So remember that he's doing a lot of trompe l'oeil, trick of the eye. That's the same thing as faux. So the, uh, a really good art history term to know here is trompe l'oeil. It's French term for trick of the eye. So this idea that this is, everything is physically flat, but it looks 3D. So all of this sculpture, all this architectural relief is all an illusion. Right? So how does he arrange figures? Like in the video and in, like Leonardo, all the main activity is up front and center. 
right? So when you're standing in this room, all those figures are there kind of like at your eye level and they're all up front, right? And then he groups them using linear perspective, right, in the space, and he groups them into smaller groups. So we've got a big group of people and then they're clustered, right? They're clustered and they're also isolated. So we have a few figures that are kind of off by themselves. Probably the most famous one that's kind of off by himself. Oop, I'm just gonna put it all out here, right? Is our Michelangelo figure, right? Because he's a broody artist. Michelangelo was not pleasant. Raphael, life of the party, everyone loved him. Michelangelo would get hit by the Pope with a switch because he was temperamental, he was argumentative, and he did not put up with the Pope. The most powerful man on the planet, he would say no to or run away and disappear for a while, right? So, so when he's organizing the spaces, he's thinking about the meaning behind the work. So in the video, they mentioned that this focuses on these ancient philosophers with Plato and Aristotle. And notice that he's using people who are his contemporaries and the greatest minds of the day as inspiration for how these ancient philosophers would look. So Plato looks like Leonardo, right? So we have them in the center and these people are kind of grouped based on their science or their belief system. So the philosophers are kind of together, the astronomers are together. Even those central figures are really kind of based on um, their core beliefs. So uh, go back to all of those um, without the animations. We have, you know, pointing up, these are people mostly on this side who are thinking about beyond the physical realm, things that you can't see. Doesn't mean all of them are that, but a majority of them are. Most of the people on the right side are people who study the earth and physical things that you can see, things that are rational. I wish I could undo that, right? So that was the School of Athens. Um, he paints other scenes as well. This is in the Vatican as well. This is a classical scene. Here's a scene of a later Pope. I think this is Pope Leo, if I remember right. Actually, yeah, never mind. So he was a fa famous portrait painter. Um, there's minute details. There's actually a reflection of Raphael in that post, right? Um, in the Sistine Chapel at the very bottom, there were tapestries that were made in um, Holland. So these are Dutch um, tapestries and he designed this scene and notice how there's reflections. He didn't weave it himself, but he designed it and then it was taken to um, the north and woven there. But notice it still has the relief at the very base, right? And then I should say, this is the one that's in the Vatican. I take, I, I apologize, not that classical one. This is the transfiguration. And this shows that by 1520, high Renaissance characteristics are already kind of disappearing. Late Renaissance art is very strange. It's kind of crazy looking. And so it's very like where high Renaissance was dramatic, but very rational. A lot of late Renaissance or Mannerist paintings is very irrational. And so Jesus isn't perfect and beautiful, right? He's kind of got like wide hips and his eyes are kind of like looking up and kind of, he looks a little out of it. But also at the very bottom, when Jesus finds that he's holy, right? This, that's what the transfiguration is. Um, his witnesses, this boy is kind of like overcome by it. And he is totally got his eyes like rolled back into his head. So it's, it's kind of this strange, unsettling image, right? Okay, so our last Ninja Turtle is Michelangelo. Um, his father was a sculptor. He was an apprentice to Gerlandio, who was a fresco painter. So even though often people say, Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, but he wasn't even a painter, that's not exactly true. He was, um, he did learn how to paint, right? 
Um, he was a member of the Medici household by the age of 14. So of course he would have known great thinkers of the day, poets, philosophers, as well as artists. Um, he was a true Renaissance man. So like Leonardo, um, he was a jack of all trades. So he was an architect, a sculptor, a painter, a poet, as well as an engineer. And he did believe that sculpture was much more noble than painting. Um, I actually have a master's degree in sculpture and um, it's always kind of a joke in sculpture circles versus painters is that sculptors create reality. They create physical things, whereas painters just try to create an illusion of it. So Michelangelo really believed that sculpture was a far superior art form over painting. And when asked how he created the David, he said, I carved out what was not him. So he was kind of nonchalant about his own greatness sometimes. And he definitely was a tormented artist. Um, like I mentioned a second ago about, you know, getting hit by the Pope. Um, he was pretty tortured. Um, he was a homosexual and you can imagine that during this time, um, that would have gone against all of his religious beliefs um, of the day. Um, and, you know, he was uncomfortable. A lot of these large commissions that he was doing were not under the greatest of all circumstances. So he was very broody. He was very moody. Um, he was not always, um, you know, such a pleasant fellow compared to like Raphael. Um, one of his more famous sculptures is the Pieta. And so this is also in St. Peter's Cathedral. Um, notice how youthful and young she is compared to her son. They're basically at the same age. And Michelangelo, I think, carves this at like age 21. So I don't want to make you feel bad about yourself, but if you're an artist, you got a lot of work to do if you're going to like be able to meet, match this, right? But you can see how beautiful she is compared to like the Vesterbild or the Rottingen Pieta, right? So here's some close-ups of that. Some of the, the great things is to notice how her fingers kind of press into the fabric, um, you know, his wounds on his hands. He did this at such a young age. This is one of his few carvings that actually has his name across it. People didn't believe that he made it, so he carved his name onto it. Um, in 1972, someone took a sledgehammer to it. So you can see it was broken, but they pieced it back together, right? And then the David, right, the David, that we have is inspired by classical Greece, but he is bigger than life. He's 13 feet tall. So one of the reasons why, you know, that quote is famous about like, he just carved what wasn't David is that there was this large 15 feet chunk of Carrara marble that no one wanted to carve. And somehow Michelangelo saw the David image within it. So this is actually 13 feet tall. So it's larger than life size nude and it's not necessarily perfect proportion. His head's a little big and his hands are gigantic. Right? So here are kind of that monumental scale of the high Renaissance. Right? So um, we probably won't finish the ceiling today. We'll get as much through of it as we can. But who is the patron of the Sistine Chapel? This patron would have also commissioned this Moses sculpture by Michelangelo. P Saint P the new St. Peter's, the School of Athens. Who's the patron here? The Pope. The Pope, very good. Thank you, Brianna. So this is gonna be Pope Julius II. So here's a lovely portrait of Julius and he pleasant looking guy. Um, he named himself, you guys um, probably, probably know, maybe not, um, the popes named themselves. Um, just like kind of the often kings and queens, they rename themselves when they become the kings or queens. Uh, popes often take on a new name. Um, and so Pope Julius named himself after Julius Caesar. Why would he name himself after Julius Caesar? Who is Julius Caesar?
he's not the dictator of Rome. Right. And he's not the first emperor, but he is the person who allowed for the empire to start. So Julius has seen his power as the Pope, as being, you know, a powerful entity, right, in the world. And so Pope Julius wanted to return Rome and the church to the greatness of ancient Rome. He collected art and literature from the ancients. Um, he reflected this interest in the imagery and um, um, the artworks that were created during this time. He also was a general. He led an, the Vatican army and was notorious and vicious. And like I said, he was one of the most powerful men on the planet during the 1500s. Right? Michelangelo comes to Rome from, from Florence because he gets the commission to make the, the uh, burial site or the um, the tomb for Julius. So Julius, in his own lifetime, like other great rulers of the day, of, of past, like ancient Egypt, they he built his tomb before he died. And so um, this image of Moses was made by um, Michelangelo for a monumental tomb. And all the tombs of the popes are underneath the ground or underneath the altar at the Vatican at St. Peter's. So this would have been kind of unique. Um, here's the design for it. This is what it actually looks like. It's very small. It's in a small church in the city of Rome. But you can see how powerful um, this is. It's very similar to like the, Mike, the, the David where it's this kind of powerful figure twisted in space. So um, with our Sistine Chapel, I think we're going to start with this on Monday. So we're going to be a little bit behind. Um, we'll have to rectify this. So um, for Monday, right, we'll focus on the Sistine Chapel for those 25 minutes. Okay, so we'll adjust that um, because there's no point in getting five minutes into this because we're not going to finish it. Okay. Um, so for, for Monday, we're meeting remote. For Tuesday, I have on my list that there are a couple of people from Central coming over. And I think I have maybe one person from North that's coming in person. If you are like in person or marked as in person, but you don't show up, you will still be marked as atten attending if you are in the building. But I would like to know if you are still planning on coming. So if you're one of the people who are in person and you're gonna be literally coming to class every day, not every day, but once a week, could you write that in the chat before you leave? So if you are scheduled for hybrid and you are coming to class, let me know, okay? I will see you guys again on Monday. Have a great weekend. Good luck if you have any finals. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mattis, I'm not yeah, give going me to one be taking uh, art history. Oh, give me one second. I just want to stop the recording.